Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus, and executive producer of the Kalb Report, public broadcasting series moderated by legendary journalist Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our in-person headliners event with Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter Mary Jordan, who will discuss her new book, The Art of Her Deal, the untold story of Melania Trump. As First Lady, President Donald Trump's wife Melania, an immigrant from Slovenia and a former fashion model, has been somewhat less visible and less outspoken than other modern day First Ladies, some of whom had already spent significant time in the political limelight. Much of the early attention on Mrs. Trump focused on the former model's fashion choices, not extraordinary given the longer range history of coverage of First Ladies. So finding the woman behind the glamorous photos was something of a tall order. Ms. Jordan, a longtime foreign correspondent who has reported from Tokyo, Mexico City, and London, won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting with her husband, Kevin Sullivan, for their investigation of the Mexican justice system. For the art of her deal, Ms. Jordan interviewed more than 100 people, including school friends from Slovenia, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer. All of those interviews added up to a revealing portrait of a strong-willed yet reluctant first lady who, during the campaign, had weathered a steady drumbeat of revelations about her husband's infidelities and post-election seemed uneasy about a move to Washington. Among her first post-election acts, Ms. Jordan wrote, was to renegotiate her prenuptial agreement to ensure a more generous financial deal for herself and for their son, Barron. Mary Jordan joins us today in the National Press Club Broadcast Operations Center, and our event, which is open to all, is being live streamed. We accept questions from our online audience. I'll ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. Mary Jordan, thank you for joining us. Delighted to be here. Over the course of your career, you've delved into serious, secretive, sensitive, and dangerous matters. Why a book on Melania Trump? Great question. I was covering the 2016 campaign for the Washington Post. And I remember watching uh, a Donald Trump rally, it was 2015, where he was railing against immigrants um, and talking about building the wall and keeping them out. And I said, I remember turning to a colleague and said, this is wild. His wife is an immigrant. And I began calling um, the campaign to try to talk to Melania Trump. What does she think about what he's saying? Um, what's her story? And I got nothing. Um, it was strange silence. You know, usually it's easier to speak to the spouse of a candidate than a candidate, but I could easily get to Donald Trump, uh, but not her. And I, I just thought, you know, she is the first, if he wins, she will be the first first lady who didn't grow up speaking English. Only the second one in 200 years uh, born outside the country. Last one was Louisa Adams in England. So I guess I just thought the public had the right to know who, who was, who is this person? You know, she has influence. She is consequential. She does, she's in the meetings with Trump. We, we write about other advisors and cabinet members and she arguably has more secrets and more power over Donald Trump than many other people. You, uh, you say in your book, um, uh, a number of people you interviewed declined to speak on the record uh, and that others cited non-disclosure agreements. Um, we can certainly speculate about what motivates this uh, commitment to secrecy. Give, give, secrecy. Give us your take based on those interviews. You know, I just want to say again that how unusual it was to like track down someone that knew the first lady and largely even thought pretty well of her, but was kind of shaking like this and said, oh my God, they'll sue me if, mm. if I speak. I would love to, you know. And again, this person had good things to say. So 
right up front, I, I just think that this, this purposeful secrecy is something to be noted. Um, I, I guess w there are many takes because I was looking at this a long time and I, I went to Slovenia. I followed her path. She, she grew up, so I talked to grade school friends, high school friends. She spent one year at university, talked to professors, followed her t where she went to Milan, where, you know, roommates, models, photographers, and all the way around until she landed in New York at 26. So what did I learn? I learned that she's smarter than I think people give her credit for. Um, she does not like it when people say hashtag free Melania. She doesn't like to be thought of as trapped or fragile. Um, she's, she has an extraordinary capacity to be alone. Um, you know, that's something that would be very hard for me. I think I hear other people say, you know, when you're in the White House, that if you, you feel kind of claustrophobic. She doesn't. She spends a huge amount of time in the private residence. And I found out that there she's with her mother, her father, and Baron. And her mother and father are critical in every way to understanding her. Um, he was a chauffeur. They, his, her, her mother um, was this elegant woman who was a seamstress, a pattern maker, uh, worked in a factory for 30 years. So it's mom, dad, Baron, and Melania as a unit, um, and they're perfectly happy in the private residence of the White House. And one funny thing is that because the parents don't speak English very well at all, they speak Slovenian every day. Uh, and you know, I've talked to people who say Donald Trump will walk by and be muttering about, I have no idea what they're saying, and it you know, drives them crazy. The Secret Service doesn't even know what they're saying. Um, she likes being in the White House. Uh, I think she was gearing up before COVID to be more um, uh, visible, be more active. I think she takes a while to settle in, and, uh, and she had said she was going to fundraise for the first time and do things, and then COVID hit, and uh, we'll, now we'll see um, what she's going to do. She's doing more videos and more calls, and she's feeling a bit more comfortable in the role. But, you know, it's such a strange time with COVID. You just talked about her parents, and you say in the book that uh, if Donald Trump believes Melania is his rock, um, her mother is her rock. Right. Talk, talk a little bit more about that relationship between her and her mother. Uh, I, I think it's one of the most important things. Um, Melania does not have a lot of friends, and even if she has a lot of friends in one part of her life, she literally shuts the door. It's, it's like they're uh, sealed parts of her life. Um, so her high school friends, when she moves on, never speaks to them again. Photographers who helped her uh, get launched once she moved on. She doesn't need anyone. And so very few people have the through line. Very few people, for instance, would know um, that she, when she arrived in New York, she was shopping at Crate and Barrel, living in a tiny apartment, um, a place with a styrofoam wall and a futon. Those people were not invited to the Melania that lived in Trump Tower. Um, so when you have someone that has so few friends, uh, she spends huge amounts of time leaning on her mother. Her mother is beautiful. One, one great little fact is that when she was working in the factory, and it was this huge open uh, floor plan with you know, sewing machines everywhere, it was a government-owned factory and uh, of course, Joseph Tito was the dictator for decades, running the former Yugoslavia, which then split up and famously had the Balkan War. And Slovenia was the, the richest and the, the best, you know, highest uh, earning power of people up there. And still, it was nothing. It was, you know, socialism. People earned very little. Um, and. The, her mom worked in that factory as a pattern maker for year after year, but she had enormous ambition for her daughter. She thought her daughter was special, told Melania she was special. She had, Melania had these, everyone talked about her eyes, you know, these sparkling eyes. And her mother made her outfits that, especially in socialism, made her stand out. You know, everyone else's, 
you'd go to the store and there'd be like one pair of jeans, one type of jeans, one type of this and one type of that. Her mom made her fantastic things. Her mom actually, even in socialist times, was so, was so talented that um, in the Yugoslav days, they sent her to Florence and to Paris uh, to get ideas to bring back for the Yugoslavian state-owned clothes factory. And she would bring back these magazines and show them to Melania. Um, and they had, the mother and the daughter had dreams of Melania is going to have all these things. And her mother said to her, according to the people I spoke with, you know, you're no, no one is better than you. You can do this. You know, it is that immigrant drive that we've heard so often. And she wanted to go to the U.S. She first went to Milan, then to Paris, but always eyes on New York City. That was where the money was. That was where the big time was. And it's rather amazing that at 26, you know, sadly, that's old for a model. That's when she arrived, and she was still waiting for her break. Never gave up, though. You, you mentioned in the book, and I'll stay with family for one more question, that, uh, that her sister is something of a secret. Um, um, and I, I wonder, based on what you've discovered about her personality and what you talk about in the book about her sister and don't talk about in the book about her sister, whether this is something that is just deep within them as a result of their upbringing and that something they brought from Europe with them. Uh, they're great. You know, several people have said that to me, that they mm -hmm. think it was kind of a Central European way. Mm -hmm. You know, they grew up in tough times where people were getting killed if you said the wrong thing politically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, Tito had outlawed Catholicism and they were Catholics, and so they kind of had a secret baptism, secret church uh, wedding. Um, it was a tight-lipped place. You didn't trust everyone. And also, she grew up in a very small place. It's a beautiful place. Um, it reminds me a little bit, you know, that, that whole area, very lush, almost like, you know, the, some people call it the Ireland of Central Europe. It's just green, green, um, and lots of people grow grapes and fruits, and it was a small place. They didn't have a hotel. They didn't have a movie theater. There was almost nothing there. And she just wanted to get out. Her older sister, Ines, that you brought up, um, makes, is so quiet, makes Melania look like, or seem like a blabbermouth. I mean, she really is quiet. When, um, you know, they, they just, the, even their friends of the parents who, who like them, like the parents quite a lot, say that they never revealed much about themselves. The White House called the book fiction and declined to make Melania available for an interview. Two questions. Number one, did that at all surprise you? Did you expect that you, you wouldn't get an interview? And did you have a sense at any point that she just might sit down with you or maybe answer written questions? Well, yes, I sent all kinds of written questions and fact checks uh, for months and months. I said, you know, I'm saying this is the date of your baptism. I'm saying, you know, very simple things to more complicated things. You know, is this right? Both fact checks and questions. And the, her office kept asking for more, but never would, um, you know, answer anything. And so clearly, in the end, I just stopped because it was clear they just wanted to know what I was focusing on without saying anything. Um, did that surprise me? No. I mean, Melania built a brand. I, I really know from what I understand and the people who work for her um, and been around her that she watched Trump build his brand. You know, there is there is image and then there's reality. And, and Trump built this image and it wasn't always real. Um, and he did that by constantly talking and having photos with these glamorous people. Her way of building an image, her image is enigmatic. Oh, the mysterious Melania. She did that by withdrawing, not speaking. And she's naturally kind of quiet anyway. Um, and it worked. And I think she realized that she could be the alluring old movie star in dark glasses. Greta Garbo. <laughs> um, you say in the book, Melania Trump has an exceptional capacity to shrug it off. Uh, 
uh, or at least press her lips together and say nothing. Uh, she never feels the need to explain herself or her marriage. She has always been independent, highly focused, and acutely aware of her own power and when to deploy it. So putting together what you've already told us with that quote, what's your sense of the personal dynamic between Melania and Donald Trump? Let me just tell you what housekeepers told me. Um, you know, so I wanted to find people who saw them have dinner together, you know, go on vacation together. I sought out uh, everyone from drivers, right? They have chauffeur. I mean, there are people who see them. So um, ultimately, I found four people, uh, uh, at least three of them are named in the book, um, who knew them over long period, who would see them um, at different times of the day. And every single one of them said the same thing, that they spend very little time together. Their dynamic is that they're independent. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they don't have a connection and they don't rely on each other, but Melania likes her space. She told me that when I interviewed her as well. Um, she did, I found funny, interesting interviews too. I did an enormous amount of research not just in the regular databases like Nexus or, or newspapers, because she was being quoted in things like Glamour, Self, uh, some of these other things that are not necessarily catalogs. So I had to go to the Fashion Institute or um, I had to go to New York and look at specialized libraries to, to find photos and, and, and things. And one interview she did in one of these more, um, you know, I think it was like a, a Glamour or a Lore, she said, I built a little spa on the third floor of the, there's a triplex, it's a three floor in Trump, in Trump Tower. And it's my spa and I built it all white and it's my place. And she's asked in the interview, well does, Trump ever, does Donald Trump ever go there? And she was like, absolutely not, that's my place. And it's also interesting it's white because he prefers dark colors, she prefers white colors. Mm -hmm. He gets up at five in the morning, she does not. He talks a lot, she does not. I mean, they are absolutely at peace with spending a huge amount of time. The housekeeper said over several periods of years that this one person saw them in the summer where they went Bedminster for two months. And she said that they never ate a meal together. Melania would be with Baron, often with Baron and her parents, and eat healthy things. Um, uh, and things that her mother would make. And then Trump would be in the clubhouse eating French fries and Diet Coke and meat um, and talking. Uh, their dynamic is to be, they have secrets on each other, <laughs> they know each other, they depend on each other, but they sure don't spend a lot of time together. Well, those eating habits sound a little like some other marriages that we <laughs> know. Uh, what's, what's the nature of, of her influence that you've discerned? Um, in the White House on uh, policy decisions and or political decisions? You know, she does not get involved in the nitty gritty of policy, for sure. You know, she's not doing Middle East policy and economic policy. Where she is the heavyweight, according to people that I quote on and off the record, and many people in the White House or who were in the White House, they said that the most dangerous place to be is in the crosshairs of Melania Trump. Mm -hmm because she could get you fired. She did get people fired. Uh, if she didn't trust you, she didn't like you, she would just tell, and other first ladies have done that. It's just that this first lady uh, actually tweeted about someone and fired the second highest ranking woman in the White House, Mira Ricardel. She was John Bolton's number two, a cybersecurity expert, um, and one of the most experienced people. Um, and where her power comes in is Trump doesn't trust very many people. As time has gone on in the White House, he has trust fewer people. He gets furious when people leave and write books and criticize him or go on TV. And he trusts Melania. So when he's hiring someone, um, he consults her and gives her a big role. But back in, uh, you know, before the election, she was critical then to picking Mike Pence. He had Mike Pence come to Bedminster, their, their house outside uh, New York City, and spend two days 
and Melania spent by far the most time with them, had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, talked to them. And also the other two runner-ups were, at the time it was well known, we were all writing about it in the press, it was Chris Christie, former governor of Jersey, and Newt Gingrich, who had been Speaker of the House. And there was lots of talk, maybe he needs Gingrich because he needs help on the Hill, Capitol Hill. Um, and Melania, and this is again according to detailed interviews of people directly involved in that selection, that once Melania, um, who was sent by Trump to interview them, came back and said, pick Pence because he's the least ambitious. He won't be gunning for the number one job, uh, and the others will. Um, and that was it. She knows also how to position to Trump. That's, you know, she knows how to p say what Trump wants to hear as well. He does, last thing he wants, as uh, Anthony Scaramucci said to me, Trump does not do co-stars. There's only one spotlight, one star, and that's Donald Trump. And playing off that answer about her role in terms of protecting her husband and protecting their privacy, um, Nancy Reagan came to mind right. when, you were, when you were talking about right. that. And I wonder if perhaps the magnifying lens is greater on Melania Trump because of who her husband is, not that he's President of the United States, but that he's Donald Trump, and that um, he has cast this this image out. Um, uh, does that put a larger magnifying lens on her than perhaps some other first ladies? Maybe also, I, I probably, um, maybe also the 24-7 news cycle, social media, the constant you know, photo taking, uh, the iPhone where you can video everything and photo. I mean, there's so many things on the, on the web about her, like, is this really Melania? Is it a double of Melania? Yeah, there's, so a lot has changed since the Reagans, and certainly Nancy Reagan was a powerhouse, uh, but she did it in a different way um, than, than I think Melania did. I think some people have said, why should I care about Melania Trump? And I think that when you have someone, she was the only person standing beside Trump in the meeting with Putin, uh, the famous meeting on the sidelines of the G7, when um, people said, what? You know, Putin had a translator there and the U.S. side it did not. It was just, uh, he used a Putin's translate, translator for both sides. That, that, had, that caused alarms everywhere. Melania was there. Melania is often the person that is in the room when no one else is and knows things no one else is. And, and that's power. I mean, she has power over the President of the United States. And so why does she matter? She's a historic figure. Very few women are in that job. She is living in the White House. She has a taxpayer-funded uh, staff of 100. Um, and she's an immigrant for, one of, for a president who preaches to close the wall and has actively made it harder for immigrants to come in even on the same visa that his wife came in on. So I, I just think that it, she is worth knowing. And, and once I started calling the White House and they wouldn't even tell you what city she was in, once that happens, I think you kind of know you, you got to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like perhaps she's in a unique category. She doesn't seem to fit uh, the um, uh, the motif of the most recent uh, previous first ladies, uh, Michelle Obama uh, or Hillary Clinton um, uh, or even Laura Bush uh, for that matter. And then you have this other category of, of um, first ladies like Mamie Eisenhower who would have been in the background uh, and strong people like Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, right, but, right. But Melania sounds like a unique individual. It doesn't sound like you could put her in a category with some of her, with her predecessors. We talked to several historians about this, and they said that the expectation by, um, starting with really uh, Rosalind, Rosalind Carter, mm -hmm. who used to sit in on cabinet meetings, um, and of course, Laura Bush did a lot especially in her second term. She was all over Africa. She took on projects. She started the National Book Festival. She was into literacy. Uh, Hillary Clinton, 
um, as First Lady, you know, tackled health care, and Michelle Obama was a phenom. You know, she, she was known for her exercise, uh, all kinds of campaigns for healthy eating. What is Melania known for? People don't know what Be Best is. There's no money behind it. There's very, very few serious efforts. I've been at those events. They often last literally five minutes for the public, and then they shoo out uh, cameras. I mean, she, can, she often stays. She went all the way across the country to Microsoft, and the whole event, the public side of it, was five minutes long. She announced she was going to do cyberbullying and then pulled back on that. There was a lot of backlash in the White House about that. Um, what is she known for? I mean, yes, she has broken the mold. And as one woman uh, who has worked for several administrations said, well, we know that, sh that whoever comes after her is going to thank her because there is now a different expectation. Melania said basically to reporters like me and everybody else, I don't have to tell you where I am. She went missing for three weeks um, and felt no obligation. Basically, they said, I'm not elected. Why should I tell you? So absolutely, uh, you know, the trend had been that the public feels that if you're given the platform of First Lady, it's a pretty powerful platform to do something. And Laura Bush was dealing with AIDS and literacy, and other people picked big things. Um, and I think the public, you know, felt like sh Melania Trump should do more. But because she hasn't, um, it'll be interesting what the next uh, person in that job, whether it's a man or a woman who's the spouse of the elected uh, president of the United States. Because as, this, as historians say, Melania Trump broke the mold. It's different expectations from now on. You, you mentioned in the book that uh, my read on it is that she appears most at ease and perhaps revealing when she's with children. Um, what does that tell you about her? You know, I'm, because so many people read in to, to certain mm -hmm. things, like, you know, I've seen her go on stage and she puts that ice face on. She'll mm -hmm. be absolutely one way behind the stage, normal, chatting with a kid, and she goes out. And it's like she's on the catwalk back in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm because they were trained at the time, no expression, no smiling. It'll detract from the clothes. And it's like she clicks into this mode and it makes her look unhappy. So people saw that and they're like, God, I thought she doesn't look happy. Maybe something's going on with her and Donald. You know, maybe it's on the rocks. They're, they're all, so I'm a little hesitant to, to you know, say, well, what does it mean about her? I mean, I think most people like kids. Um, I think she is, I know from people who sat beside her at official dinners, that she is so on guard that she barely speaks. And that's not true with kids. Uh, I think it's a trust issue. I think that she doesn't trust people. She's worried about saying the wrong thing. Um, and she, I mean, people say that she trusts people a lot less than Trump, and Trump doesn't trust very many people. <laughs> and what um, what did you learn about her relationship between um, uh, the relationship between the first lady and and President Trump's other children, particularly Ivanka and, and Donald Jr. Well, um, you know, so Donald Trump talks about the old his oldest three. They're they're older, Ivanka, mm -hmm. Don Jr., and Eric. But you know, there's a feeling among people in that close to them that they're they feel like the real Trump children. They're the children, they call them the real Trumps. The children of his first wife, Ivana, who was from the former Czechoslovakia. Then he had Tiffany with a brief second marriage to Marla Maples, um, who unlike Melania, wanted him to come home from work and wanted to be with him. And Melania does not, doesn't bother her. She's absolutely fine by herself. <laughs> um, and, and then there's Barron, who, um, you know, D Trump already had four kids, but Melania wanted another child. There's definitely a feeling that he talks about and is closer to the, the older three, according to many people I talk with, including people who took care of all the kids. Um, and there's not a lot of uh, cozy love between mother and stepdaughter with Ivanka and Melania. They're both former models. They're only 11 years apart. 
they hit the modeling world in a completely different way. 14-year-old um, Ivanka Trump was on, getting on s headlines and news splashes when she became a model. She, was on, she didn't have to work very hard to get on the cover of a magazine, whereas Melania was going to audition six and seven times a day, traipsing across uh, Paris you know, on a subway in bad parts of town, according to a roommate. She slogged her way up, and there's very little in common between Ivanka and Melania. And I think this little story tells you about how they get along. When they came, uh, when he won, shocking everybody, including the Trumps, um, and they first came to Washington after the inauguration, uh, 2017, January, Ivanka said, you know, why don't we make the first lady's office the first family's office? Let's call it that, you know. And then, and then she was eyeing real estate in the East Wing, which is the real estate for the first lady. Melania heard about that and, of course, squashed it. But there's, you know, they, you know, they don't spend a lot of time with each other for sure. <laughs> and the, the nicknames, of course, uh, that I heard, uh, Melania calls uh, Ivanka, behind her back, the princess, because she says she's spoiled and thinks she's royal. And, um, and Ivanka has been known, especially when she was a teenager and her dad was going out with Melania, to call her the portrait because she spoke about as much as a painting on the wall. The, um, the president and the first lady have occasionally uh, been at odds in public statements. Donald Trump was for quite some time, as we know, during the pandemic, consistently dismissive about the need to wear masks. Uh, to stop the spread of uh, COVID, uh, while Melania has worn one and urged others to do so. Um, are there consequences uh, of this? Does it anger Trump when they're not on the same page? No. In fact, uh, at times, it's been an orchestrated good cop, bad cop. Um, for instance, Donald Trump tweeted something about LeBron James, you know, I'm from Cleveland, and uh, but you don't have to be from Cleveland. He's a hero to many, many people. He's done all kinds of things. He's not just a, one of the greatest basketball players, but he's um, revered by many people. And he tweeted something unkind, and immediately Melania followed and said something nice. Sometimes she's used, uh, or or allows herself, or offers herself. It's not, you know, she sa you know, she says, "Hey, you shouldn't have done that," and then we'll correct. But they're working as a team at times, um, and I've seen that in many ways, but not always. Um, and I don't know in the specific mask case, but clearly she has been calling, while Trump is not talking about using the words. You know, we're all like the unifying words and about persevering and kind of those lofty words. She's using them both on her Twitter account and she calls first ladies around the world and says and says things um, like, how can we help? Uh, you know, we're all in this together. I'm so sorry about your losses. This is a tough time. She's doing and using words and doing things that he's not. Um, and no, I, there's absolutely no consequences. Uh, she has her own power. She's sure to tell you that too. Um, I mean, she, when I again, when I spoke with her uh, during the campaign, she used the word "I'm," in, you know, she said "I'm independent" so many times. It was probably the most frequent thing she said. She kept going back to that, and it's very important to her uh, that people don't think that she, you know doesn't have the power she does. You said she calls first ladies around the world to see how, um, how she can help. Um, have you ever gotten a sense that she's called any of her predecessor first ladies to talk with them? Um, she ha has spoken um, briefly with Michelle Obama, but they're, you know, for, because of the, probably the thing that people can't forgive Melania mostly was that she backed Trump up years ago. This is not post 2016, but years ago about the birther cons false conspiracy theory, which, uh, you know, Michelle Obama has said, you know, endangered her family. Like basically Trump was on TV and, and every, every way he could kind of saying that, you know, 
I don't think Barack Obama really was born in the United States. Where's his birth certificate? And, and this led to all kinds of things, like he's illegitimate president. Once Melania was asked in an interview about that, and she backed her, her husband up, um, I think a lot of people, including anybody on the Obama team, really didn't, you know, it was not an easy fit. Uh, so, so because of the handover, she spoke with Michelle Obama. She has spoken to Laura Bush. Um, but no, she has not reached out. She has, the White House Historic, Historical Association told me that she has asked for all kinds of books and other things about what the for other past First Ladies did. So even though she might not be talking to them, she is reading. She does read a lot, uh, and she is interested. She is refurbishing all kinds of things in the White House. I thought one detail was quite interesting. She, you know, she, she and her whole family, her sister and her mother, have a knack for decorating and and um, designing. And one of the rooms, the curtains were fit. One of the public rooms in the first floor of the White House um, needed the, the sun had faded curtains and things. And she said, you know, you don't need to um, throw those curtains away. Let's turn them around and put new tassels on them. Saved a lot of money that way. I just thought it was an interesting frugal thing from, from and that was done. Um, and she, um, you know, every so often you, you kind of realize she did grow up being frugal. She grew up very modestly. She lived in an apartment. Uh, and now she's pretty wealthy. But you can still see sides of how she grew up come through. So the most publicized revelation um, in the book was that Melania Trump renegotiated her prenuptial agreement after President Trump won the election. Um, some people would say, smart lady, good for you. Um, uh, so what did she end up getting out of that? Well, I think that the really interesting thing, and that's the title of the book, is The Art of Her Deal, right? In, in his best-selling book, Trump's best-selling book, called The Art of the Deal, Basically, he said, nobody's a better negotiator than Donald Trump. You know, I can get a better deal. There's no one who can get a better deal. And he laid out why he was such a good deal maker. And he said at one point in that book, um, it's all about leverage. When you have something the other person wants, or better yet, can't do without, that's leverage. So. Melania, who has read everything her husband has, done, um, has written um, and certainly had a ringside seat to how he negotiates, waited until he was in politics. And that's why you know, people say, I don't think Melania liked politics. Politics has been the best thing that happened to Melania because when he was, she was the wife of a, a wealthy guy in New York, you know, she didn't have the power she does now because, uh, you know, he could cheat on her and, and not have consequences. Like, it hurt when the, when the revelations about his infidelities came. It hurt him politically, and he needed Melania. He wouldn't have needed those in New York. So she, fully aware, very upset, by the way, of, about the, that the whole world knew he had cheated on her with these women, that his own lawyer paid hush money. That's leverage. OK, you know what? I can walk or say something very bad about you, uh, and you will be the three times divorced president. She's more popular in the polls with his supporters than he is. So he didn't want that to happen. That's leverage. You know, when, when excess Hollywood tape came out about 30 days before the November 2016 vote, right? It's neck and neck. It's, Hillary, are we going to elect? the first woman president of the United States or Donald Trump. Um, and then this excess Hollywood bombshell report came out. And he's talking gross, vulgar things about grabbing women. Well, that was the moment where Melania Trump had all the power. And they were negotiating already at that time. This is right before the election, the prenup. And, and it carried right in and went on th through uh, arriving in the White House. He goes up. It took him two hours to go up in the elevator to Trump. Uh, to, to, he was downstairs when he saw it with uh, he, Bannon was there and Jared and Hope Hicks and the whole team when they watched and listened to the, the Access Hollywood tape. Many people thought the race was over, you know, that Hillary would win. 
And Chris Christie, who was also in that room, said the elephant in the room was Melania. If she didn't back him up, if she walked, why would female voters vote for him? She called him a pig or said this is disgusting, whatever. It took her a while, but she ultimately calculated there was more for her to stay than to walk. And she didn't do everything that they wanted. She wouldn't sit down for a joint interview with him, but she took her time and did go on a big interview with uh, CNN and backed him up. And you said in, in the book, I think you were quoting Chris Christie at that time, um, but, you, but you said that, um, that uh, the, um, the aides watched the, the interview that Hillary Clinton had done um, uh, sitting close to Donald Trump, and Melania would have none of that. She, she said, no, no, no. So she called her shot on that. That was the moment she had power, and yeah. that is leverage. And I think whether, you know, how you see Melania Trump often depends on if you like her husband or not. But even people who don't like her husband at all kind of gave her kudos for, you know, moving in when she had leverage. What did she get? She wanted an equal share uh, not just money, but an equal share in the Trump Organization for Barron to the older three. They all have cut different deals. The, uh, the uh, financial agreements with his three wives were very particular, very different. Uh, when M Melania cut hers, it was a long time ago, and she just wanted more. And while I don't have the specific numbers, I have from three different people that she got more. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's talk for a few minutes about writing. Uh, you've written several books. You have another book due out at the end of August, this time with your husband, journalist Kevin Sullivan. Tell us what you've learned over time about writing books. And um, uh, what do you know now that, that perhaps you wished you'd known when you first started uh, working on some books? Excellent question. Um, doesn't I think the hardest thing about this book was I kept wanting more. She is, it was easier for me to get, I was stationed in Tokyo for four years, and I got to the head of the Yakuza, the organized crime. <laughs> I felt like I knew him. I not only interviewed him, but people around him. I was in Mexico for five years. I was, I spoke for hours with the head of the cartel that the uh, DEA said had killed more than a thousand people. You know, I feel like I know how to report. You know, I've been a reporter a long time. And she was such a hard target because she had so few people around her. She cut people off. She threatened people or Trump did with legal action if they spoke. Um, and um, I think that you write well when um, you feel really, you, you have all the facts before you. And it took so long to, um, to get the facts that, uh, that I had to write really fast at the end because you know now it mattered. We needed out this year. We want to know more about her, um, and and so good writing um, means you know you have the facts. And I, I it just this one was brutal because the reporting was really hard. I, I I went to five countries. I sometimes had to go back five times to someone saying please talk to me, and only then would they would they do it. Um, I had to have hired translators in four countries. I spent probably, I don't know, 400 hours translating things from, uh, from French. Um, uh, I had to get Italian translators, Slovenian translators. It was, it was just time consuming. I, I guess in the future, um, the joy of writing also is that uh, you surround yourself with people that you um, you learn from and you like and um, you inspire you. And I must say that some of the people that I had to speak with um, and and who are along this path uh, were not that way. It sounds like as a journalist writing 
books that uh, any sense of frustration you had along the way comes back to the basic tenets of good journalism, that you want to base it on fact and that you want to corroborate those facts. And uh, it sounds like this one was uh, pretty tough. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I wanted documents and I got yeah. them. I mean, I yeah. found videos in uh, attics in Slovenia. They didn't, they, don't, they didn't archive. The country split and, and that led to, that also helps Melania have a black hole because mm. not just the language is difficult, the archives are difficult because some of the things literally were, you know, I had to not just find them in attics and go to people's houses and beg them and wait there in Slovenia. And then I had to, you know, change them for a format that I could see on my computer now. Mm. Um, she is, I would say, I mean, it is the most interesting thing to me is what is she really thinking um, about the immigration? She loved this country. She loved CNN. I thought, it's, you know, CNN opened her eyes to the world, she said, uh, when it came to Slovenia in 85. Um, and Reagan was in the White House, and John Travolta and Princess Diana were, were on the dance floor, and people there said she just wanted to go to New York. She wanted the American dream. And I know that her father has had some issues with, with Melania, and other people in the family are not happy about his immigration stance. Um, and I think that we're getting closer to a fuller picture of this woman now. As a writer, as a journalist, um, talk a little about covering the private lives of, of public officials. Um, at one time, we would not have routinely touched that particular arena, as evidenced by the lack of writing at the time of previous presidents. John F. Kennedy comes to mind. Um, um, are they entitled to private lives? Um, and how sensitive is it for you uh, to draw any lines in helping to reveal more about a person and, and what makes them tick? Very important question because uh, as we look to the future about who wants to be, who wants to run for office, who wants to be our leaders. I think the press does have to think about that. Um, I asked, I, I write very little. I know a lot about Barron Trump and I write almost nothing about him. I know more about her parents than I include there. I include what I think sheds light on someone who has power over the President of the United States. She is absolutely somebody that the public has a right to know more about. Um, and so it was constantly thinking about what to leave out and what to leave in. There were several things that I learned that would have made headlines but would have hurt people, um, not Melania, but other people around her. And why do that? I, you know, I'm not a journalist to gratuitously Make hits. I, I, my goal in this was there was a strange void of information about the First Lady of the United States and I wanted to fill it with facts and get documents and photos. The photos alone were really difficult to get and I had to, I didn't even, there, I was looking through men's magazines in Europe that I didn't even know existed and were kind of embarrassing when my kids came in the room. <laughs> and I found photos in there that I included in the book. Um, but She's absolutely, fill the void, get the documents, learn who is she. Um, you know, for instance, I learned there, I found a tape of her saying she was one of the highest paid models. This was a 1998 tape that, that I listened to, I have, and I talked to the people who were at that press conference. And then I called her agent who, who laughed. She was never uh, one of the highest paid uh, models in the world. She exaggerated just like her husband did at times. That is fair game. But um, I, there, there were definitely things that, yes, they would make headlines, but they would either hurt people, they were gratuitous, or I didn't include. And my takeaway from this is that therein lies the difference between a tell-all book and a tell-what's-relevant-to-the-subject book. Sounds like that's the boundary <laughs> for yeah. you on this. Um, I'd like to talk for a few minutes, and, and the, the hour is going very quickly. I'd like to talk about the state of journalism. Here we are at the National Press Club. We have many journalists watching 
um, as, as we're having this conversation. Um, the top of the National Press Club homepage uh, contains two statements. The first is a quote from the late Congressman John Lewis, who said, without the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. And the second comes from our club leadership, and, and it reads, reporters are witnesses. To silence the press is to silence the people, silence accountability, and silence truth. This has been one tough year for journalism. Um, yes. With our colleagues literally running toward danger every day to cover a global pandemic, um, what appears to be a generational outcry for racial equality and social justice, um, and an assault on the truth that yes. uh, that many believe um, is is hampering our ability as a nation to drive forward in a positive direction. Um, in addition, we're losing valuable coverage to downsizings and uh, in some communities, the elimination of news organizations altogether. From your vantage point at the Washington Post, which fortunately is well-funded and maintains a firm commitment to quality journalism, what's your take on what's happening and its impact? It's heartbreaking as somebody who went into journalism, um, you know, I grew up in Cleveland where you're supposed to make a difference, do your part to make, you know, things better. The fourth estate is a check and balance. Um, when I see that in part, in no small part because of what the President of the United States is doing about calling the media fake and, you know, even because it's advantage to him, even if it's real, undermining the press, um, lying, um, all the misinformation, disinformation going on the internet. It's more worrying even what's going on here. I mean, you know, people are showing up at events that are not real. We had this bizarre pizza gate. We, we, we see the consequences that people can get killed for misinformation in America. But you know what's going on abroad? where I've spent so much time, is they say American media was our leader. We would look to them. And in Mexico, um, when reporters who wrote the truth were getting shot by the cartel, now that's happening in many places. And it's not by organized crime, it's by the state. You know, in, in, in different parts of the world, including Hungary, in, in other countries, there's new censorship. It is the most alarming thing because you want to inform voters. You want to inform people. You want them, you know, we have to do our part. We have to be right. We have to be careful. We, you know, we have to back it up. And, and we need to do our part never more. Um, and we, I really hope that American journalism again can be that shining star because when I'm speaking to people in Europe and in Asia and other places, they miss it, and they're go people are going to jail for writing about uh, leaders in other countries, in Asia and in Europe. And sh you know, shame on us. We, you know, things have got to change because it's led from the top here, and it really has been damaging, and it's heartbreaking. Despite what's happening, or perhaps because of it, um, we are reading, hearing, and seeing some of the finest journalism that's ever been produced. Uh, and young people are enrolling in journalism programs in record numbers. Um, what's your guidance for those who want to pursue careers in the field? We need you. <laughs> we need smart people. Um, it is never more important. I taught journalism uh, at Georgetown, um, and I um, think it matters so much and I'm so happy I know this is happening because I get calls all the time I think people know the value when you you know they often say you when you when you don't have something or when you you know when it goes away that's when you value it and and people are valuing it they want to know the truth I you know they, they want guardrails they you know they want to know this flood of information from Facebook and Twitter and, and what is real what is not I have friends that are teaching kids who, from kindergarten, y even younger, how to identify what's a false, what's false, what's made up, 
you know. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, of course, at heart, but I do think that, uh, you know, I, even writing every single day at the Post, uh, we're, we're constantly attacked. When, when other leaders around the world do what is coming out of the White House many days, if anybody writes anything critical of you, say it's false. And we, we've seen the copycats around the world. Mm. We want to be the leaders again. Let's, um, let's return to the book for a couple of final questions. Donald Trump seems to have this love-hate relationship with the press. He covers the press and, and he loves doing everything he can to damage the, uh, um, the press. Uh, what about Melania? Well, do you get a sense of, uh, of what her thoughts, feelings are about the press? Oh, I <laughs> sure, certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> She reads nonstop. In, in fact, in the White House, people were saying, God, I wish you would stop reading because even obscure criticism that almost no one, she would tell Trump about and then he would get mad. Mm. She reads and reads and reads. People wish she would step away from the computer. She's angry about it. You know, she went on TV and said that she was one of the most bullied. She said the most bullied and then she said one of the most bullied. It's because she's reading everything. Um, and there is a lot of nasty stuff online, you know. Um, and she does not have any love in her heart for the media. She feels that uh, no one has any right. She says she's not elected. Why should anyone write about me? Um, I don't know if she, I mean, she came from another country. It was, a, you know, I, I don't know how that is going to change. Somebody who knows her probably better than anyone said, you know, I don't know if she will ever really open up, ever. Like, you know, think of it, if Melania wrote a book, you know, what would she say? But she, she is so, even people who knew her for years and years and years said that it was always superficial. So what would she say? She, she, but clearly she shares her husband's um, suspicions about anyone writing about them. She feels it's her story. She should tell it as she wants. But wouldn't it be interesting if she would actually answer questions and tell us from her point of view? But that hurts her brand because she wants to be mysterious. Do you think this presidency has changed the landscape going forward, or is this still perhaps an anomaly? Uh, a lot will depend on how much longer this lasts. Mm -hmm. um, that question is an asked and answered across the country at dinners at night. Um, it's had a massive effect. Um, but again, I'm optimistic, and you know, it's one leader could cha has changed a lot in America, and you know, in the future, whether it's this time or next time, who knows what another person, where they could lead the country? Because uh, there's a lot of great people in this country, a lot of people who want to do great things, um, and having the great advantage as a journalist, I've spoken to people all over the world. You know, America has uh, great things going for it. A lot of people still want to get here. Um, and so I'm optimistic. And what's your takeaway, having written this book? And, and finally, what would you like readers to take away from it? I think that uh, there's a lot of myths about Melania. She's not trapped. She doesn't need to be afraid. Uh, she is savvier. Um, she uh, does every so often, especially in immigration, get annoyed about what he says. And yet she has calculated that for the moment at least, she always thinks of what's good for her and for her son. And that has been to say little and to keep the course. Um, but she is more independent and more influential than people realize. Okay. And uh, that will be the last word. Um, our thanks to Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter Mary Jordan, author of The Art of Her Deal, The Untold Story of Melania Trump from Simon & Schuster. Mary, we are very pleased to present you, I will pull it up, um, with uh, our uh, famous National Press Club coffee mug. You, you may have a uh, match set of these uh, <laughs> by now, I'm, I'm not sure. As well as a copy of our own book uh, called uh, Tales from the National Press Club, 
written by uh, a former colleague of yours, Gil Klein, and uh, also a former president of the National Press Club. We hope that you'll be able to join us again very soon uh, in the near future. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Appreciate You're terrific. It. Great questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our thanks to the organizers of today's event, headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Line, Juan Leger, and Lori Russo, our producer, Lindsay Underwood, and our terrific National Press Club team behind the scenes here at the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your good questions and for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.